We'll see many more coming in, I'm pretty sure. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this round robin of fabulous female entrepreneurs tonight. Venture Cafe is a nonprofit organization. We are relying on corporate innovators and organizations to provide all of our programming free of charge, both online and offline. Uh, tonight, we'd like to thank and rec recognize the Canadian Consulate in Boston for sponsoring this session. The Consul General has recorded a welcome message, uh, so I would like to play it before we introduce the panelists and start the session. So give me just one second. I will share my screen to play the message. Beautiful. Can you see my screen? <laughs> yes. Yeah. There we go. need to uh, make the video bigger. My name is David Allward and I'm Canada's Consul General in New England. And I'm coming to you from our home away from home, just outside Boston. We're really pleased to be sponsoring this special event and to see that despite the challenges before us, we're finding creative ways to connect. It's now more important than ever. Several women-led Canadian tech companies have planned to be here in Boston in person, but with this virtual session, we now have more Canadian entrepreneurs participating, and that's a good outcome. As you may know, the Government of Canada recognizes that women are integral to international trade and to our overall economic prosperity. Women-owned businesses help drive the Canadian economy and represent over $150 billion of economic activity in Canada, as well as employing more than 1.5 million Canadians. The business development section at the consulate in Boston is here to help Canadian women-owned companies tap into global opportunities. Engagement events with counterparts play an important role in connecting women entrepreneurs and ideas. I invite you to listen to the pitches of some of the best of our Canadian companies, but also ask that you stay in touch with us. We're here to help you grow your company. Wishing you a fruitful event and please stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for a wonderful message. Uh, let me introduce our moderator, Bobby Carlton, one and only. Um, Bobby Carlton is the founder of Carlton PR and Marketing, Mass Innovation Nights and Innovation Woman, uh, and an award-winning marketing PR and social media professional. In 2008, she started her own company, the first one, Carlton PR and Marketing. Her second company, Mass Innovation Nights, has launched more than 1,000 new products, which have received a combined of 2.1 billion in funding. Her third company is Innovation Woman, which is an online visibility bureau for entrepreneurial, technical, and innovative women. Women. She is a Mass High Tech All Star and a Boston Business Journal Woman to Watch. On to you, Bobby. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I think we can actually like kind of really swiftly move on to our entrepreneurs uh, because that said it all for me. Um, thank you very much for having me. And I am so excited to introduce this absolutely stellar panel. Uh, I love the title of this. It's uh, She Solved It. And uh, I think what we're going to do is go down the line. I, I don't know if everybody sees the same lineup that I do in the same order, but my first uh, panelist is Sonia, and I'm going to have all of our uh, female entrepreneurs tell a little bit about themselves and their company. So why don't we start with you, Sonia? Okay, sure. Um, I have a slide uh, yep. deck. Should Share I go that. for it? Okay. Go for it. All right. It says host disabled um, attendee screen sharing. So, ah, Yulia, we need you to un un. Uh, <laughs> Undisable that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's working now. Okay. Actually, meanwhile, while we're waiting for that to get disabled, maybe one of our other speakers who doesn't have a slide presentation. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. There we go. Can All right, see? we're good. Okay, great. I just put a few slides together. I wasn't too sure um, uh, too sure about our format or whatever. So uh, if you could bear with me, that'd be great. So I am here to change the lab testing industry. 
all my life, I was sure there's something wrong with my hormones and I could not get my hormones tested. A host of hormone related health problems um, ensued, including infertility and recurring miscarriages. I'm happy to say I went on to have three kids, but my health didn't improve until I got access to testing. And now I say my hormones are just make me crazy enough to think I could change the lives of a billion women. And so I started blogging about women's hormone health and reached women in 175 countries globally. And I was the terrible blogger. So it really validated for me um, how underserved we are in, in our healthcare. So I, um, whoop, hold on here, move the slide forward. 47% um, of women, in case you're wondering, between the age of 30 and 60 report having had um, hormone imbalance. And 99% of the women in my network that I, uh, some of the women that I uh, surveyed that have hormone and thyroid uh, conditions want access to real-time at-home testing. So uh, I am a non-technical founder. I put together a world-class global team uh, to help me develop a product and bring it to market to remove the gatekeepers to testing. And so meet our QT sensor and smart cartridges. We're using nanotechnology and a microphotonic sensor. Uh, there's no special skills required and no pre-processing of the sample, which makes it easy enough to be used at home. We're developing a big data and AI platform to deliver personalized insights uh, into your data. And then really important for me is closing that gap between diagnostics and treatment. And now with telemedicine just going through the roof, it's perfect timing actually, where we start plugging in these kinds of at-home point of care devices to really support the telemedicine industry. We have filed our core patent and we're building a patent portfolio around our tech. So the way it would work, actually, I have a little um, prototype here. It doesn't really work, but you drop a, a drop, place a drop of blood. Can you see it on the cartridge? And pop it into the sensor. And before you can finish your morning coffee, results would be delivered to your smartphone. So the way we make money is using the razor and blade model. We'll sell the sensor and the cartridges. Um, the sensor, uh, we know we can sell it for, uh, or we know we can produce it and, and sell it at around $300. I'd like to get that price way lower, but that would be at a 60% margin. The smart cartridges will have multiple tests on them um, and they'll be disposable. Uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, one thyroid test in the United States can cost $300. So this is a significant cost reduction, um, even at this, and, and I'd like to bring that price down. At 2 million users, we're at a billion dollars in revenue. Enter coronavirus, and um, I just really believe that it's a societal responsibility that if you have an innovation or tech or any way to help the world right now, that you have to try. That's my um, you know, core belief system. I'm a conscious capitalist. And so I talked to my team of scientists and said, you know, look, what can we do? Is there something we can do? And so they uh, um, rolled up their sleeves and started uh, down that path. And so we're designing a five minute COVID-19 test um, that could potentially be a home use test deliver the uh, results really quickly before you have symptoms because it would be at the RNA level, not at the antibody level. And, um, and then actually using um, Bluetooth technology, um, we would have real-time data on the spread of the uh, virus. And so I think it's really critical that we get to work on uh, helping find a solution as much as you know, my vision is to solve the problem that women have in hormone health. We can put that on the back burner and, um, and get to work uh, hopefully creating some uh, further solutions uh, down the road. So that's uh, my story and uh, I'm sticking to it. So thanks for having me. All right, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. I think you need to oh, unshare. You're back. Okay. Um, and uh, Natia? Natia? I'm so sorry. I should have asked how to pronounce your name before. So. Oh, no worries. Like I tell my students, just think of your knee and go Nisha, and you Nisha. have my name. Thank you. So give us your five-minute pitch. No problem. So I'm also going to screen share because I thought we were required to do a presentation. I am coming to realize that was optional. So one. You got it. Flaunt it. <laughs> we're going to try. Let's see if they're going to give us any trouble. And 
when I said quickly put together, I think that's the theme. We got to pivot and do a lot of <laughs> pivoting in these times. So my name is Nisha McCray. I'm the executive director of a STEM nonprofit. And the STEM nonprofit is called Bajika. And what Bajika means, even though just like my name, it could be kind of hard to say or pronounce, it means idea. And that's because we're about ideas and those who create them. And the reason why I started this nonprofit was that my experience being an undergraduate at MIT, I realized that there were a lot of students who were coming up with brilliant ideas, but they weren't given access even at a top tier engineering school, let alone the kid on the bus who's seven years old, who thinks their ideas don't have merit, not being able to share their ideas that could actually be solutions to challenges facing ourselves and the world. And so I wanted my organization to empower people to actually be able to go, okay, I know how to bring my idea to life or product design and development. I know how to go through the pathway and I know what resources and skills I need in order to help others and make this a reality. And so that's pretty much what we do. I would like to say that we do this through hands-on workshops. So we go to schools, nonprofit organizations and do workshops in over 11 countries in which we teach the process of how engineers like myself bring your ideas to life. So Sonia, I loved your presentation because I was like, yes. CAD models and renders, this is what I'm about. But what I truly love doing as well is that I also host a public access television show. And through that public access television show, which I included some screenshots and a GIF, we basically take pop culture. So it could be Black Panther or a Star Wars film. And we show kids how to actually bring those props or things they saw in those movies to life using digital fabrication, such as 3D printing, electronics, et cetera. And we mix in baking and all these other things. And so I wanted to start off with the story about pickle juice. And just for the record, I hate pickles. So this is a difficult story for me. But most of you may know this woman as Nicki Minaj. And Nicki Minaj first came on scene around 2008, 2009. And I was still a sophomore at MIT at the time. And I remembered her telling this story about, had I accepted pickle juice, I'll be sitting here still drinking pickle juice. And at first I was like, I don't know why she's getting caught up on this pickle juice. What's the actual story about what happened? And so I'm gonna keep it very high level, but apparently she was a special guest, a musical guest, who was supposed to perform one of her debut singles. And you know, usually in a green room, they offer you snacks or slippers or roses to greet you to a show. And instead, because she was apparently a no name to this actual television show, all they had was a jar of pickle juice for her. There was no pickles in the pickle juice jar. There was no anything pickled of a variety. It was just pickle juice. And so she refused to go on the television show and give her musical performance until they fitted out her guest room the way they would for any other musical guest. Eventually they denied her request and she moved on. She later made sure that anytime you interview her, you have her on brand pink index cards. There is no pickle juice in her guest room, etc. Now, I'm not Nicki Minaj. And you may be wondering, wait, I don't have Nicki Minaj problems. Why is she talking about pickle juice? And so I just wanted to share a quick bit story about why you probably have had a pickle juice moment. And I like to call the pickle juice moment is being boxed in. And so I'm an entrepreneur. I can be called a social entrepreneur. I can be called an engineer. I can be called a product designer. I can be called an educator, YouTube host, what have you. One of my moments of actually being boxed in a little bit was basically dealing with folks who felt, and we're going to call it weird because I'm highly technical, but um, some people were like, oh, she couldn't possibly be an engineer. She must be that person who's just like teaching the kids and looking cute. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in my experience on how I solved it. But yes, and I need to stop share because yeah, I'm not, not good at the Zoom stuff yet. It's been my first week. Great. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to move on to Kristen now and uh, hear a little bit about how she got started in uh, her company. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't have any slides. Um, That's okay. So you, you just get to look at me with this awesome background. Um, thank you for the consulate uh, from Canada in Boston. Um, very happy to be here and, and super excited about the quick pivots and agility that, that everyone is showing in this new environment. Um, my name is Kristen Anderson. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Catch. We provide portable benefits for those who don't get benefits from an employer. So we serve freelancers, contractors, gig workers, independents of all sorts, 
um, in this current environment, serving a lot more people who don't have that classic employer safety net. So we do things like tax withholding, retirement, health insurance, all that stuff that if you're lucky enough to work a job that has you sitting in the comfort of your home right now, um, you probably get provided from your work. Um, and so we, for the last several years, have been representing a large and growing workforce that didn't have access to those products, whether because they are uh, Uber drivers or freelance photographers or hairstylists or interesting fact, did you know that court reporters are all 1099s, like the ones who are uh, doing notes during uh, trials are all 1099 workers. So they don't have access to these sorts of products. And what we believe is that those products are really critical towards financial success and stability. So a one minute detour on a history lesson, which is to say that the United States is one of the only countries in the world that requires that these sorts of products be distributed by the employer health insurance, retirement products, those things coming from your boss are a relic from World War II and before. Um, there were certain tax credits that were issued uh, during World War II. There was a wage cap that was put in place in order to not make uh, wages go too high while much of the workforce was fighting in the war. And so as a result, employers looked for other ways to offer incentives to bring workers to their companies. And one of those was offering health insurance. Fast forward about 70 years, and we've now seen that the entire infrastructure of our benefit system has been constructed around this idea that there's an HR department that provides you access to these sorts of things, and that you will start at a company when you're 20 years old, and you'll retire when you're 65, and you spend 45 years at one company, and that's the way we work. And I think most of us know that that's not the way most of us work, and it's changing very rapidly. So we wanted to make some uh, something that was easy for individuals to access. So we made an app because we've all got smartphones now so that people could set aside for taxes, invest in their own retirement and access health insurance, high quality health insurance um, without having to figure out all that overhead themselves. And the customers we represent, as I mentioned briefly, cover a lot of different types of work. And I think for those of us who work in tech, it often feels like there's like one type of worker, right? That person who sits behind their desk and they show up at an office, maybe, maybe not, um, but they get to work from home if they're lucky like we are. Um, and they just like earn income on a regular basis. But actually about 80% of the workforce doesn't work like that. Um, and we need to find ways to provide them access to things that will protect their future and will make them financially stable and give them access to these products like health insurance. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, we launched in 2018. We have um, about 35,000 users right now all over the country. Um, and our goal is to help increase that access so that we can finally decouple the benefit system from the HR department. Um, the crisis at hand and the fact that our economy has basically shut down in the last week or two has been a really interesting time for us. Um, we've certainly seen the pain and challenges that a lot of our users are facing individually in terms of not being paid, um, working places that have suddenly just sort of like stopped paying, put them at zero hour contracts or laid them off altogether. But at the same time, we're seeing a huge amount of innovation coming in terms of people looking for new ways to work. And we believe that you know, this workforce is strong and we will come back. And there is going to be a really important time where people are saying like, wait a minute, why is this infrastructure the way it is? And we wanna make it more efficient and make it so that people can access it on their own, like according to their own needs and flexibly with their families. So I feel like I, I maybe should have had slides around all of this, but I think the, the key thing that I wanna leave people with is that the way you're working today is not the way you're gonna be working three months from now, but it's also certainly not the way you're gonna be working three or 30 years from now. And we need to make sure that we have the financial infrastructure in place so that people can earn money however they want and still have access to things that make sure they're stable and protected for the future. Great, that sounds terrific. All right, Michelle, you are up next. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Right. So I am Michelle Wax. I run the American Happiness Project based here out of Boston. And I now over the past six years have founded three companies across different industries, always bootstrapped the companies, ran a bunch of Kickstarters, have always kind of 
done things really lean. And um, my latest project is American Happiness. And what we do is we combine the neuroscience of how your brain is hardwired from birth, along with the practical psychology research that I did across all 50 states to really share how to live a happier, more fulfilling life. Um, because what I found throughout, you know, my whole entrepreneur journey so far is that the majority of people want to be happy. It's just, it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. And so this is what I do today through uh, now remote workshops and uh, through one-on-one. -on -one. So we do things on the science of happiness, how to build positive habits in your life, um, how to generate energy throughout the day, and really tie this all back into not just the science behind it, but also what's actually working out in the country today. Um, because I've always been really fascinated in what the everyday person is doing to really build a strong mindset and um, live a fulfilling life. But um, this is a couple photos of me here. So basically, this was along the whole journey that I filmed a documentary across all 50 states last year. And that was kind of the initial research done and have continued doing it since then and speaking um, across the country at colleges and universities and companies. But three years ago, I was in a very different spot. And um, I mentioned I had two other companies in different industries and I was in the food and consumer goods business. And so, you know, when I was a kid, I had the lemonade stand, we sold cookies, me and my brothers, we would scooter down to the end of the road, set this lemonade stand up. And I thought that's what I wanted to do with my life. I thought I wanted to be um, in the food business to really be more in baking and have either a bakery or something along those lines. And I reached a point where in 2014, I was working in tech here in Boston, and I started uh, really small on the side, started with $300 in my apartment here in Somerville, and started figuring out how can I actually start this on the side with very little funds, not a ton of time, I was still working a full-time job, but I was able to start and grow Kitchen Millie from $300 to having a team here in Boston and working with really the top companies um, and clients throughout the city. And um, about two years into that started uh, the local fair, which you can see the top left-hand corner that's right before we opened. It was a kitchen incubator space in Arlington, Mass, where I uh, initially started out as a storefront where we would sell local products, but quickly realized that the uh, foot traffic was not great because it was in a residential area. And so we, me and my business partner, knew a lot of people in the food industry and in consumer goods just from doing farmer's markets and events like that. And there's a real need for commercial kitchen space in Boston. And what we started doing was not only renting out the commercial kitchen space for other small companies to start and grow their businesses, but we also began teaching all the mistakes that we had made along the way. And so we were doing series and workshops and uh, I wrote a book as well, interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs on really how to start very small and grow to whatever point you wanna be at. And I was coming from tech, and so I had this mentality that I had to grow to be this, you know, national company, millions of dollars. And it took me a while to realize that, no, I don't need to do that, right? You can choose to grow your company however you want. It could be a lifestyle business. It could be um, a side business if you want to keep it like that. And so I've reached this point where externally, right, I had great clients, great press. It seemed to be everything was going well. But internally, inside of myself, I was waking up every day and I was feeling super stressed. I was feeling really worried about the future and I had a lot of self doubt. And it didn't make sense to me because objectively, I could see that there's a lot of good going on in my life, right? And people were coming to me, uh, congratulating me on the success and all this stuff, right? And I felt just not the happiest. I wasn't in a dark, dark place, but I really didn't understand it. And I reached this point of frustration because I felt guilty, guilty about it as well. And I personally started digging into how the brain is wired and how that was affecting really how I was kind of interpreting and almost felt like my brain was naturally going to this place of stress, uncertainty, and self-doubt. And I started implementing the things I'd learned into my own life, made a tremendous impact. But um, I wanted to see, you know, what's working for other people, right? Entrepreneurs, but also just everyday people with jobs or side businesses. And so I had this crazy idea to drive across the country. Uh, thankfully, I would instilled really great teams with the food company. So I was able to had a little bit of flexibility to travel and film this while those were still running in Boston um, and ended up selling them when I came back uh, this past summer. 
but basically wanted to really capture and interview Americans from all walks of life on how they're really reaching consistent levels of happiness and fulfillment, regardless of external circumstances, which obviously there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. How are people instilling this in themselves regardless of income levels, regardless of relationship status, where you are in the country. It's really interesting. And so I was capturing all this all across the country, um, doing more informal interviews where I'd be at farmer's markets, like here I am in Alaska, talking with Kenny. But also a lot of it was a bit more formal and I was sitting down and recording this and discovered along the way that there's a real hunger for this information out there. And so now what I do today is pair these two things together, like I mentioned at the beginning, and build out a bunch of different programs. So right now I've moved everything remote, um, doing a lot of Zoom recently. Uh, so I, I love it. I love it. It's become, this backdrop has become like my home. Um, but do remote workshops on the science of happiness, how to really sharing the practical things that people can implement in, into their lives to build this strong, positive mindset, which is so important in entrepreneurship um, and really just in life and also do one-on-one -on -one and some community events as well. So that's me. If anyone has any questions after that come to mind, feel free to email me anytime. Yeah, so we're actually going to, um, I've got a few questions and also we'll be taking questions from the audience. So uh, let's go back to Sonia. The right people and the right team are obviously keys to growing any startup. Can you talk a little bit about how you built your team? Uh, yeah, sure. So. Um, it's interesting. I'm a non-technical founder, I think I mentioned. And so, um, you know, coming from a place of just a patient starting a medical device company doesn't really, uh, that's not the usual path. And so as a non-technical founder, I felt like it was even more important for me to build a team of the absolute, you know, top-notch people that I could find. And it didn't always work out. Um, the people that I uh, went out to uh, work with or meet or whatever um, didn't end up uh, being all uh, the people that I work with now all the time. We were working with one university group trying to solve the problem and went down that path for about 18 months before we realized that you know, the way they were approaching it wasn't going to work. So I'm now working with scientists in Estonia. And so um, I think the big thing is I'm a very outgoing person. I'm not afraid to um, ask people, um, you know, to come and work with me or their opinions or whatever. And I think that's been really key. Uh, we picked up a phone and called somebody in our network who um, is renowned photonics expert who has lasers that fit under airplanes and said, you know, Sergey, could you shrink your laser and, and help me build a handheld device and put a team together? And that's how um, my team over in Estonia came together. And then my, um, uh, my data science advisor, I stalked him on Twitter. And uh, he's a data science uh, advisor, and he wrote the book Hacking Healthcare based on the US healthcare system. We had had some Twitter conversations. And um, I was at a health conference and went and met him and uh, three weeks later he was here in Toronto and we've been working together ever since. I had an advisor from Duke University. I'd been following his stuff on social media and I sent him an email just out of the blue and he became my advisor. That's how I, I was able to, you know, attract people just with the vision, with you know, being able to reach out. And then of course, other people as well, same, some of my medical advisors or people that I just, you know, reached out to because I love their work and I love how they talk about women's health. And, um, and that's, you know, sort of how I started building my team. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Nisha, I am curious, how did you ha know you had the right idea? Well, I think for me, there's a lot of nonprofits. There's a lot of people in the STEM area. And for those who don't know, STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. There's a lot of people in that field. And I think for me, I am not an outgoing person. I am a very, I'm a high level introvert, high functioning introvert. And so it's hard for me to know if it's the right idea because I'm not the one who gets a lot of feedback or I'm willing to put myself out there. But I think the moment when I realized was when I was on the T and there was a little girl who kept staring at me and I was like, oh God, stranger danger. Like I did not provoke this child staring at me. She's with the school group. I don't want the leader of the school group to get kind of freaked out. I'm going to look away and slowly move to the other end of the car. And then finally she was like, 
Miss Nisha, I know you see me. And I'm like, oh God, she knows my name. Who is this girl? And then she started talking to all the other kids who were like, who the heck are you yelling at this stranger on the train? And she was talking about how I came in and did a hands-on workshop with her one day and how she saw one of our episodes on YouTube and was going like, oh, you're the one who made that Black Panther like hat. Like I made the hat, but I didn't get a chance to 3D print it. And she was just going on and on. And I was sitting there like, are my, are my weird nerdy videos and projects actually getting kids interested in STEM? It's not just a weird hobby for me. Like this actually is a good idea because now there's 25 young kids on the train talking about 3D printing and how they want to be engineers. And so it depends on who you are. I like to think the universe will greet you in the way that you respond to it. So because I need someone to shake me out of my normal to let me know it's a good idea, that was my <laughs> experience with it. I've known other people to have more subtle clues, like an email drops in their inbox to let them know, or an advisor tells them. I apparently need a creepy moment of feeling like I'm going to jail before I realize, oh yeah, it's a great idea. <laughs> That's great. You know, it's always that first uh, customer you interact with, you know, so the ones that, that love you. Um, Kristen, is the problem you're solving for something that's changed? In other words, are you solving a different problem today than when you started your journey? Uh, that's a, a very timely question, I think, for all of us who run businesses right now. Um, but I think one of the interesting things that we set out to solve was the idea that the safety net in this country particularly was not equipped to serve a changing workforce. It's, it's barely equipped to serve the country that we have now, but particularly as work changes, it's not keeping up. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I, I, I really like that question because what we're trying to solve for hasn't changed at all. Um, it, is, it is the same thing. And I, I think in, in terms of what Nisha was talking about of finding something that, like, that you connect with and that's important to you is a really important way to say I'm solving something that matters. And I think a lot of, from my perspective, so you know, I, we started our very earliest days as Bootstrap. Um, we moved to a venture-backed business. We went through Y Combinator a year ago. We've raised $8 million. We've been extremely fortunate in terms of the support that we've had financially. Um, but the starting point had to be based on like solving a problem that we knew and understood and that, that resonated with us. Um, and that was like our true north. And I think if that's the way that you build your business and that's the way that you try and solve problems, we're gonna see a lot of venture-backed businesses. And don't get me wrong, I don't feel sorry for them at all. We're extremely lucky, venture-backed companies, we have a, a particularly cushy lifestyle, but um, a lot of venture-backed businesses are going to close in the next couple of years. They're gonna shut down, they won't be able to continue operating. But I think the ones that are going to survive are going to be the ones that had a real problem to solve to begin with. Um, and, and I saw this really interesting insight about that, which was, we're going to find out which companies were vitamins and which companies were painkillers. And a lot of the companies that were this sort of nice to have and this sort of like, oh, well, wouldn't it be kind of cool if, you know, those are the ones that are not going to survive. But the ones that are truly solving a fundamental need and a fundamental challenge and like Nisha, like this like core um, who we are, how we learn, what we pursue, the society that we serve, like those sorts of businesses are going to succeed. And I think that's a really important part for us where the, the problem we're trying to solve didn't change. And that was a really important thing for us is you can watch your entire world be rocked and say, wait a minute, what we're still trying to do is the same. It's, it's almost more critical now. And I think that was an important part of building our business was checking in on that and saying, what is it we're trying to do? We're trying to create financial stability and wealth for people who have not been served well by existing products. That, that still holds true. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the nice to have products are gonna struggle. And I, I'm, I'm super excited by this panel because I feel like you've got, you've got a group of women here who really have looked at like, what is a real problem and how do I relate to it and how do we solve that together? Yeah. So I'm going to jump back in and uh, uh, Michelle, are there things in your background, your upbringing, training, life experiences that impact how you address problems and challenges? Maybe you can share a story with us. Sure, sure. 
Yeah, so I think it all really comes down to perspective on current situations. And a good story I have, my dad has always provided some pretty good perspective, especially when I was, I'm a lot more confident now and sure of myself. But when I first started out in the, in the food space, I definitely wasn't at all. Um, and I found myself just kind of having to build that really over time. But my dad would always say to me um, when I was going into a new situation or a new challenge or just something that I wasn't quite sure of or not as confident in that thousands of people have been through the exact same thing before and you'll be fine. And he would always say that no matter what it was, if I was going for a job interview before I started the companies, whether I had you know, not used finance as well in the business or something else had gone awry, I printed the wrong barcodes one time on a shipment, it was a disaster you know, everyone is, has gone through or gone through some variation and it will work out and just kind of keeping that perspective and it, taking a step back can be really, really important, especially when it feels like everything is going wrong. Um, taking a step back and what I also like to do is keep a running list of all the things that I actually have done that I'm proud of in my life. Because then when I am having a moment or a situation where I don't feel as sure or I feel down on myself, I can go back and read that to almost hype myself up in the moment has been really powerful. Great. Um, I do want to actually invite our audience to put questions into the webinar chat. Um, I have obviously endless questions that I can ask our panelists today, but if there are cool questions that you want to ask, please uh, pop them into the chat. So uh, I have another question for Sonia, and I'm curious how you knew you had the right idea, Sonia. Um, so I think if you saw my slide there, 99% of women that I surveyed want access to real time at home testing. And so I, uh, my story uh, to entrepreneurship is kind of an unlikely one, uh, but it makes perfect sense. You know, I had problems starting from adolescence with my hormones and then started solving those problems over time and really advocating for myself. I'm old, way older than the rest of you. And so this was, you know, pre-internet. And, uh, and so it was harder to get information and harder to advocate for yourself. But every time I'd have a conversation about hormones with women, I heard the same story over and over and over again. And that's why I started blogging, hoping that I could, you know, just help one woman. And so when I reached women, you know, from all around the world and then started building a social media network and uh, really validating uh, that. But I didn't do the, um, the survey until much later. So I felt like I already had my finger on the pulse of this patient community, um, not just fertility, but polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, thyroid disease, perimenopause, it just the list goes on and on and on. There's so many um, hormone related conditions. And then when I did the survey and um, and got that 99%, it even blew me out of the water. I knew the number was gonna be high, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, kind of validated that we're on the right path. Great, we've got a great question from Diana. She's all asking all of our panelists, looking back, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your startup journey? So maybe uh, let's pop over to Kristen. You wanna start with that one? Uh, that's put you on the spot. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think it's a balance because I think sometimes learning the lesson is important as well. And sometimes the journey is the lesson. Um, but if I had to not give a fortune cookie answer for you, um, I, I would say the thing that I wish I knew was, um, that we were right. That's going to sound crazy, but like, that the things that we thought we knew that our hypotheses like were correct. I think when we started particularly fundraising, any, anyone who's tried to raise venture capital money can tell you like it is demoralizing. Um, there is constant rejection. There is just, I mean, it's hard for women. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for everyone. It's also hard for women. Um, but I think that there was this constant like questioning of like, do I know anything? Do I know anything about what I'm talking about? And recognizing the further we got into the process, like everything that I know now versus two years ago when we, when we first launched and when we first started fundraising, um, 
is just like more true. Like we, we weren't wrong. It's, it's almost like the, every piece of feedback we've been getting, every step that we've made down the journey has really reinforced what it is we were doing. And I think that that confidence was really hard to fake early on. Um, I, I had good data. I had, I had surveys, I had, you know, market research, I had all of that sort of stuff, but I think it really speaks to what, what all entrepreneurs need to do at the beginning. And Bobby, I know you can talk about this better than anybody, but it's like knowing your customers, like getting close to your customers and understanding what they need and reinforcing that, like what you know about them is unique because you're close to them in a way that others aren't, whether it's venture capitalists or critics or whatever. Um, and I think that that was something that like, I am just now, I've, I've often said, we're going to be raising a, a series A soon. I won't give a date, but we'll be raising a series A. And uh, I've often said a series A feels more like your thirties than your twenties. And being in my thirties myself, it's often like, it's knowing yourself. It's having a confidence in what you're doing. It's, it's recognizing the value of everything you're doing. And that, that took me some time. And, and I think it would have been, um, it would have been beneficial for our business if I had had this confidence two years ago. Gotcha. Any of our other panelists want to track uh, uh, to that question? You know, raising hands? No? Oh, I'll yes, Michelle. I'll add to it. Hey, <laughs> Kristen, because <laughs> I feel the same way about the confidence factor. Um, so the, I, I do this every single day still, is I work on building belief in myself. And however, people do it in different ways, but that's the most important thing because people, not, not necessarily even in a malicious way, but they'll just sneak in a comment that if you don't have that strong self-belief, it can kind of deter you or derail you sometimes or make you second guess yourself. And like you were saying, you're normally right. If you have done the, the research, right? If you feel it in your gut, right? There's something there. And to have that belief and to keep following it, even when people try to poke holes in it or say that's been done before, that's really, really important to build. Okay. We've got another question here. Oops. So it'll help. Oh no, I am unmuted. Awesome. Uh, we have another question from Kristen. What connection or relationship had the most positive impact on your business as a founder and why? Misha, is that something you could address? I can try. I mean, for me personally, I think the most positive impact I've had on my business in terms of relationship has been with other entrepreneurs. And I say that because a lot of times when you're in your silo, an investor, like I completely agree with Kristen that sometimes you're going like, am I crazy? Did this whole room full of men just tell me that there's no possible pathway, like there's no reason they should invest in a STEM nonprofit because why are these disadvantaged groups gonna ever enter engineering or product design development or work for NASA? Like that's not a worthwhile return on investment. And I was like, okay, but I'm here in the room staring at you and I've taught your children how to use their 3D printers you got them for Christmas. Okay, but talking with other entrepreneurs, letting you have your gut check reaffirmed and letting you know like, hey, this venture capitalist is kind of a, we can't say on a live chat. You should probably avoid them at all costs. Maybe you want to pivot. I've had some success with this fund, or I've had success with this entrepreneurship program or this accelerator allows for you to navigate those landmines better than other folks who could be in your circles. So for me, like I always lean on my mom because my mom has always been my rock and she's been my lifelong entrepreneur friend. But then I thought about it and I was like, she's also an entrepreneur. So I feel like the best connections I've had have been with fellow entrepreneurs and in particular fellow female entrepreneurs who know the additional hurdles that may not be clear for other entrepreneurs who can see. Right. And we got a follow-up question um, about the comment on belief. So um, we've got a question on how do you actively build up on self-belief? Yeah, I can take that. So this is such a great question. And um, what I love to say about building confidence, building belief is it's really keeping the promises you make to yourself, no matter how small, because you're building up that trust in yourself, which is so incredibly important. And it's just small things. Like you say, you're going to wake up at a certain time. You don't snooze. You actually get up. And what happens is these things compile. If you say you're going to send the email to that person you really don't want to, do it anyway and just keep building that up. It really builds confidence and belief. The second thing is listening to 
content that is going to instill that in you. And it sounds almost like if you haven't listened to positive content before or content from people that are at a place that you might want to be, um, it, it rubs off on your brain in a way that you wouldn't even believe because the more and more you listen to it, it actually rewires your brain differently um, is what I discovered. And this is what I went through the whole process. So I definitely recommend keeping those promises to yourself and actually tracking them is important because then you have a track record of everything amazing you're doing in your life. You're building that belief and self-confidence and then listening to positive content. I have a lot of playlists I can share if anyone's interested in those too. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Karen Feinberg. Uh, let's start maybe with you, Sonia. How do you recenter yourself after a critical comment or rejection? And they would love examples. Oh, wow. Okay. After I have a great big cry about it. <laughs> um, you know, I think self-care is super, super important and just kind of on an ongoing basis. And, um, you know, being an entrepreneur, the highs are really high and the lows are really low. And so you have to find some sort of way to keep um, steadfast and steady. And uh, rejection is just such a part of it. And it, going back to that earlier question, um, not how much I wish I knew, I'm so thankful I did not know how hard this would be <laughs> because I might not be sitting here today if somebody had really, really let me know how many challenges, unforeseen challenges, like here's another one who would have expected this. And um, so many entrepreneurs are facing, you know, the challenge of their life right now. And so um, rejection, when you're out looking for angel investing, uh, angel investors or venture capital, um, it's constant rejection. Um, applying for accelerators and getting rejected and feeling like that other person who got accepted, you know, their company's not as, their tech isn't as robust as yours, or it's not going to change the world or, you know, whatever's kind of going on for you. I think those are just, um, you have to really roll with the punches and you have to take uh, care of yourself and learn um, boundaries, I think, that uh, keep you healthy. And um, for me, I bombard myself, kind of to Michelle's point, I bombard myself with positive um, messages. I listen to a great inspiring podcasts. I, um, I meditate. I go into nature a lot. That's part of my self-care. I, you know, think through problems when I walk my dog in the forest. I happen to live in the country, so I'm pretty lucky that way. But finding somewhere where I can um, really find that, uh, get that center. And then the other thing is I'm so passionate about what I'm doing. And uh, if you don't uh, have that desire to talk about your company and, and work on your business for um, day after day, 24 seven for years and years and years, you're probably working on the wrong business. So I think, um, I think that kind of helps you rebound from the rejection and, and the, you know, sort of challenges that you face as well. Great. I know we've got just two minutes before we have to jump off. Um, and so maybe all of our entrepreneurs can quickly like share a tip, uh, maybe just, you know, like one minute, uh, super fast. So maybe starting with who wants to go first? Yes. No. Oh yeah. Kristen. I'm going to just jump on that tail end of that comment. I, I would say one thing. So I have a male co-founder um, and I would say one thing that I think is really important to recognize is that women are often not trained to deal with rejection in the same way that men are. And from a very young age, we are taught to be likable and to make people like us and to need to succeed at every single step. And I think an early and, and open acceptance of failure is really important. And so like bringing in context of those people around you who can help center you on the like, oh yeah, this is perspective. Like if just as a, as a dumb example, like a man can go out to a bar and like hit on 50 women and they can all say no and he'll like wake up the next day and be fine. And I think that that has been a really important piece of it for me. So I guess to close, I would just say like, um, recognize that, that some of the challenges that we have um, from our upbringing, from the culture that we exist in, from the challenges of being women in general, um, can be counterbalanced, not just by being by ourselves, but by leveraging a community, not just of women, but also of men to help provide context and like forward motion for what it is we're trying to do. 
Yeah. I know exactly what you guys mean in terms of the rejection. Like, you know, the first speaker who unsubscribed from Innovation Women, I swear it was like the end of my life. And um, she's like, I didn't get any speaking invitations. I'm like, you didn't fill out your profile. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So who wants to jump in next with uh, last minute tips? Um, I guess we can jump. Oh, there you go. Um, I guess I can jump in. So long story short, I would say puff your chest out. That's something that I feel took a very long time for me to get over because I'm used to being in a tech field and used to playing like the background person. And when you're leading your own organization and you have to do the fundraising and making sure your team is okay and that your clients, especially clients that you personally care about, not just looking at the money, you need to puff your chest out for them. And I agree with Kristen's point that we are raised to be likable or be the one who's like, oh, you know, I don't need much or blah, blah, blah. And I, especially as a girl from the South, used to say, oh, that's okay. I'm totally fine even though I'm freezing and it's 20 degrees and I have no jacket. But puff your chest out and demand what you need and not be if you can, not because I know a lot of people are not in that situation, especially given these times, to puff out your chest and go, you know what? I don't need this. Because for me personally, there have been multiple times in my life that I look back and I wish I had stepped up instead of cried in the bathroom or in a corner about what happened, puffed my chest and walked away. And I think my company would have been in a better position. Fortunately, I am learning those lessons now. And I know it's tough, especially if you're a woman and a person of color. There's a lot of barriers to being able to puff your chest. But trust me when I say it's worth it on the long run if you're serious about your company to start training that muscle. All right, we got to move on to Michelle. Last minute tips. All right, my last minute tip would be that the hardest part is always starting and taking that initial step and then continuing to take the steps. And if you're starting something out or you're thinking about doing something new, take that initial step and just stay consistent with it. That's the hardest part. Um, And yeah, that's all I got. (laughs) All right, and Sonia. Unmute. There There you go. Sorry. Um, Oh, geez. So many tips. Um, Watch your language in emails. Never say just. um, Don't ever say, you know, I think this. There's different ways to communicate. Men communicate quite a bit differently um, than than women. And I've learned that over the years uh, that uh, we can just uh, like... uh, Uh, Like Nisha said, ask for what you want. And then imposter syndrome, that was huge for me at the beginning. You deserve a seat at the table and you deserve to be there. You're awesome. And just always remember that you deserve the seat at the table. That was huge for me to get to that realization. Great. Thank you all so much. And uh, thank you to the Venture Cafe for having us here today. Take it away, Yulia. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. Thanks everyone for joining those who are in the room for this entire time. Thank you, Bobby, for fabulous moderating. Thank you, all of the panelists for sharing your insights. It was extremely, extremely um, helpful for everyone. I'm pretty, I'm sure of that. 